UCL. Uh, his presenta presentation title is uh, Social Orchestration. So, please, Daniel. Hello. Okay. My sincere apologies for that. I had to restart my computer. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, today, now that it is working, I will be talking about social orchestration and how we can use signals from physiology uh, to predict people's bonding with each other, with their liking of each other, and perhaps even the success of movies. So um, Hilke already gave a background to some of what I was talking about when she raised this idea of synchrony between brain signals and what that can tell you. But before we go to that data, I'd just like to step back a little bit and think about coordination in a slightly broader sense. So we know that behavioral coordination is a very widespread phenomenon. We see it across human societies and across animals as well. Uh, you can see it in the mating uh, dances of flamingos here. Uh, it occurs in sporting events, either deliberately or accidentally. And we even have dancing chimps uh, expressing themselves in dance that is coordinated in a certain fashion. So you can see the phenomena of synchronization emerging in all different ways across the natural world. What we're particularly interested in here is the psychological consequences of that coordination. What does it do to people and their relationship with each other? And we know also a lot about this. We have seen, well, here's an example of that Anthony Scaramucci, who was the press secretary for Donald Trump. And you can see him mirroring almost every single one of Donald Trump's particular gestures that he does. Uh, we know psychologically this would cause Donald Trump to like him even more, paying tribute to his master. Uh, he was fired two days after that. So it didn't really work, but he was attempting to ingratiate himself. Uh, we also know this relates a lot to liking and affiliation. So I was testing out my uh, motion tracker in my lab, and I got my two lab assistants to wear it so I could track their motion. And while I was fiddling with the computer, they started to flirt with each other, as undergraduates do. Those are two 20-year-olds. One is telling a joke. The other is pretending to find it funny. And you can see something of a similarity in how they're moving. And we know that that relates to their liking of each other. We know it's not just pairs and individuals, but something about the coordination of large groups of people also has a psychological effect. So this question may not have occurred to you before. It was a surprise to me. But why do, uh, why do armies march? What is the point of the military marching? Because ever since, well, the idea of being in a straight line and walking very slowly with everyone else has been a very bad idea since the invention of the machine gun. No one marches on the battlefield for about 200 years. But why does every single army engage in some sort of coordinating marching ability? It's because it has a psychological function. So we know that if people march in time with each other, it changes their feelings to each other and to the person they're marching with. There's a wonderful experiment by uh, Scott Wiltemuth, who asked undergraduates to walk up and down in a car park, either by themselves or in time with another person. He then took them into another lab room, and he gave them a box of bugs, of wood lice, and said, we're doing an experiment for the medical department. We want you to take these wood lice and throw them in a grinder to churn up their bodies and kill them to turn them into a paste. What he found is if people had just been walking behind another person, marching in time with them, they threw more of those wood lice to their death. They were more obedient. They gave up their self of autonomy and obeyed the person who they'd just been walking with. So we know that behavioral coordination has these deep and profound effects in between two people and with a larger group. And all the time I'm using these words synchrony and coordination uh, interchangeably, but they do mean slightly different things. We know that all these psychological effects don't depend on exact synchrony. So synchrony would be doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. But lots of these psychological effects just demand a looser coordination. So I've used the term social orchestration because in an orchestra, uh, all the musicians are not doing the same thing at the same time, but they are coordinated. And that sort of looser coordination, uh, that sort of copying of gestures, seems to be what has a psychological function. So if you look at my two undergraduates there, they don't lean and laugh at exactly the same time, but they're doing the same gesture uh, out of time with each other. And what we do uh, scientifically is put a number on how well they are coupled in their temporal structure. So we know that behavioral synchrony has profound psychological effects, 
But we also know more recently that uh, coordination under the skin, physiological coordination, also has an effect too. So we know that if there is uh, uh, two people who are romantically involved and find each other attractive, uh, if they simply look into each other's eyes, their heart rates will begin to synchronize. In a wonderful study by um, Ivana Kolakova, she studied these uh, firewalking rituals that happen in Spanish villages. And here the whole village gathers to watch someone walk across the hot coals. And what she did was track the heart rate of the person walking across the coals and the heart rate of all the villagers watching. What she found was increased coordination between the walker and the spectator that depended upon their familial relationships. So if that was a cousin, they had one level of coordination, uh, their brother another, their son another. So depending on how close they were in their familial bonds, there was more behavioral, uh, sorry, physiological coordination with their heart. We also know that in teams, uh, they're in town today, aren't they, the New Zealand rugby team, uh, we know that their coordination has an effect. Emma Cohn has done work showing that uh, if teams exercise with, you, with each other, so they do press-ups, so they do running in time with each other that coordinates their physiology, that will change their pain thresholds. They will push themselves through a pain barrier more if they've been engaged and physiologically synchronized with their teammates. Also, we're looking at uh, audience uh, heart rate and how that changes over time. And John Hogan will be talking about that on Saturday. And you might be surprised that there are such strong effects of uh, physiological coordination because I can't see your heartbeat directly. So how can it be that um, uh, synchrony between our heartbeats has any sort of psychological effect? Well, let me just try and uh, convince you that your physiology, your heart rate, your body temperature, these things can be closely linked to mental processing in a way that might be surprising. So this is work that Tom Curry will be talking about uh, this afternoon, but let me just show you uh, the data side of this project. He'll be talking about it from a, a business perspective. What we have here is people wearing a wrist sensor that tracks heart rate, body temperature, and electrodermal activity. And what you're seeing is two spark lines there. The one on the top, the darker, the darker red one, that's responding to someone listening to an audiobook of The Game of Thrones, the passage where Ned Stark is beheaded. Apologies if you haven't seen it already. Uh, the lower line, that's someone watching the same scene, but from the HBO TV adaptation. So they're engaged in the same fictional content, thinking about the Game of Thrones, but in one case it's on the screen, and the other they're listening, imagining it. And what we find is when people are listening to the audiobook, they have a higher heart rate, they have a higher body temperature, and they have higher electrodermal activity. Why is that? Well, that's because if you're looking at the version on TV, HBO has created that show for you. They've done all the imaginative effort. They've produced this wonderful uh, bit of TV that you're uh, engaged with. But if you're just listening to the audiobook, you have to generate all that imagery. You have to do all of that imagining. And all of that mental effort to imagine something that you're listening to, we can read off at the wrist. All of that mental processing shows up in increased heart rate and skin conductance and body temperature. So we can peer into this imaginative world just by using a wrist sensor. This is other work we've done on uh, audiences. This is um, uh, 60 people uh, watching the movie Aladdin in the cinema. And here you can see their heart rate, temperature, and electrodermal activity during the course of the movie. And what this shows you is that they are coordinated in some way. If all of these signals were random, if these people were doing all sorts of different things, these averages will be flat. But they all peak together at certain moments. In fact, it's quite sweet. You'll notice about two-thirds of the way through, there's a particular peak, and that is when Aladdin gets his first kiss. That is the emotional build-up to this crux of the moment, the, the key of Act 3, and their heart rates go faster, their electrodermal activity increases all at this moment. So we can see, just looking at the averages, that people are coordinated in their response. Uh, they're responding to something about the emotional structure or the plot in that movie. So then you can ask a sort of applied question, given that we have physiological coordination between people, can we do anything with that? Can we exploit that? Can we use that information to make any predictions? And this is where we get to work that uh, Hilke was talking about earlier. She gave two examples already of people looking at movie trailers and tracking their brain activity and looking at coordination between their brain activity. And this is another example. Uh, this one uses uh, EEG. And in this work by Domachowski et al, 
they showed people um, a TV show, The Waking Dead, one of these zombie movies, uh, that had adverts in between at the regular time. And they tracked the EG signals from about uh, 24 people while watching this TV show with adverts. They then computed a measure of neural similarity across these brains. So they didn't look at particular areas or test particular hypotheses about this area will be active. They just looked at how similar is this brain activation, regardless of what it's doing. They used those measures of brain similarity to predict the viewership of uh, The Waking Dead. So when did people turn off that TV show? When did, across the time course of that show, when did more or less people tune in? Across the whole United States. They also looked at ratings for the adverts in between uh, each segment of the show. And they got ratings from people across the United States saying how much they enjoyed this advert. And they found that the brain activity correlation amongst 24 people predicted very well how the entire country would rate these adverts and the degree to which the entire country would tune into this TV show. So again, along with the examples that Hilke raised, here we have examples of neural synchronization predicting something about the population, about the wider market responding to this stimulus. Now, we already had a question that was raised, um, I think Hilke raised at the end of her talk, of what other technologies might be able to exploit this sort of effect. And that's where we stepped in because we had already been using these empathic sensors to measure uh, electrodermal activity, heart rate, and body temperature. And we reasoned that if neural um, activity, if mental processing can be read off in the physiological signals, well, maybe we can look at the synchronization between the physiology and find similar results as people with a very expensive fMRI machine or complicated EEG signals. If it is true that there's something fundamental about similarity between people's response, we should find that at the wrist as well as between the ears. So what we did, we realized we already had some answers to these questions. In the experiment with Audible, where we threw up these audiobooks, we also had uh, those video clips, the HBO version of Game of Thrones and so on. So what we did was look in IMDB, the movie database, and look for ratings for these movies that we showed small segments from. And we thought, well, if this reasoning from Domachowski and other people and Hassan is true, what we might find is similarity between people's physiological signals and the ratings of a larger population, the IMDb ratings. And when we looked into our data, to our great surprise, uh, that is what we found. It was a weak correlation, but a significant one. Uh, so those are the eight different uh, video clips there and our significant relationship and here we're measuring what's called the determinism in the EDA. So EDA is sometimes called galvanic skin response. That's the sweatiness of your skin. And determinism is just a particular technique that produces a number uh, to tell you about the temporal structure between two signals. It uses what's called cross-recurrence quantification analysis, which is a very complicated technique, but it just puts a number on this sort of orchestration. It's a way to quantify temporal coupling between signals. And we have found that if we look at that determinism in the galvanic skin response, uh, we find it relates to how much the wider population rates these movies. Of course, this was just a, a, a one-off, so we thought we should replicate this. If you put the individual, um, uh, individual movies in, you get an even uh, stronger correlation. Uh, we replicated it. Uh, we used those same video clips. We presented them to another 60 subjects, and we found the same thing. This seemed to be a reliable uh, result. So then we thought, well, let's see if we can push this farther and see if we can uh, predict other things about a population's view of some stimuli. And like the other work that uh, Hilke mentioned, we used uh, movie trailers because they are freely available and we can get information on the movies that they relate to. So in this experiment, we picked eight of these trailers uh, that had a range of uh, ratings. So some were very successful movies, some were less so, some were rated very highly, and so on. So we tried to get a range of success in our movie trailers, and we picked eight of them. Each uh, movie trailer is about two minutes. And we presented them to our subjects, and we asked them to watch these movie trailers and then give us explicit ratings of how much they liked these things, how much they intended to see the movie, and so on. And then we looked up statistics on the market response to these movies. So how much money did they actually make, uh, how many people watched the YouTube trailer, and so on. And what we found, if you're looking to, so here we're looking to predict the global movie sales. Uh, that is our, our overall measure of the success, the market success of these movies. 
And what we found is if your job was a movie executive, you're trying to predict how successful this movie would be, uh, you could ask people, how much did you like the movie based on the trailer? But we found no correlation whatsoever between the subjects liking for a trailer and how successful the movie was. Uh, we also asked our subjects, would you pay to see this movie? And there was no correlation with their actual uh, global box office sales. We also asked, would you um, see it if it was for free streaming? Again, no correlation with the global market sales. Uh, we also asked them various measures of engagement. So how much did you feel you were part of the story? How much could you imagine? How much did you want to see what was happening next? All of these measures of explicit engagement, and they didn't relate to global box office takings. Strangely, we also looked at the IMDB ratings, and they did not predict global box office sales. There's very highly rated movies that people didn't really want to see. Then there are movies that are rated lower that sold very, very well across the world. So if you're a movie executive, this is very disappointing. You're not getting any useful information out of talking to people or reading movie reviews if you want to know which movie is successful. But when we looked at the EDA, and we again, we quantified the temporal structure within the signal, within the physiology, we found that there was a correlation with these gross movie sales. That's every individual trial, uh, so each dot is one person watching one trailer. These are the movies that we, uh, that we showed them, and you can see there's quite a strong relationship here. Uh, as opposed to all of these explicit ratings, the implicit measures of physiology are predicting these movie sales. As I say, this is when we look at the determinism, the temporal structure in the galvanic skin response. What we found, one puzzling effect of, uh, of our data, is when we look to the heart rate coordination, so this is a different aspect of physiology, what we found is that that correlated uh, with the YouTube likes. Now YouTube likes, whether or not you liked that trailer when it was put on YouTube, those don't predict global movie sales either. But those were predicted by our heart rate coordination. So for some reason, uh, people's immediate response to the trailer, uh, how their heart is responding to that, seems to be related to YouTube likes, but their galvanic skin response, which is another measure of arousal with a slightly different time course, that seems to be telling us how they would like, uh, whether or not they were paid to see the movie across the world. So within these physiological signals, they seem to be even predicting different aspects of a response to the stimulus. Overall, what we seem to have found though, is that uh, coordinated physiology seems to predict movie success, as far as we can tell. Now, there might be various reasons this might be. You might say, well, maybe it's just more response predicts movie response. Uh, so if I watch a trailer and I have higher heart rate or higher skin conductance, uh, I'll have more similar skin conductance to everyone else, and also I'm very excited. So is it just overall level of physiological arousal that predicts success? Well, that's not true, because we looked at the average heart rate and the average galvanic skin response and body temperature. Those things did not correlate with box office sales. So it's not overall level of activity, it's more specifically the coordination between people. It's not simply that we have a similar response uh, relates to something being uh, liked or, or not. What we think is happening, and this is sort of the answer to the question at the end of Hilke's talk, why is it that synchrony is producing liking and producing uh, box office success? What we think is happening is you will have a coordinated physiological response when a stimulus is more engaging. If that stimulus is engaging and has more of an effect on each individual, if the stimulus is driving their cognition, driving their mental response, then there'll be more similarity between people. If people are disengaged, if they're not attending to the stimulus because they don't like it or it doesn't capture their imagination, then they'll have more different responses. So that similarity is because that stimulus is taking hold of them. It's taking them on some sort of cognitive, emotional journey that's producing similarity between them. And that success in engaging them with the trailer is related to the success of the movie as a whole. That is our best hypothesis so far. So a successful trailer exerts a stronger influence on participants, and it orchestrates their physiology. It's a stronger uh, um, top-down influence on what they're looking at. So this is data that we've gathered already, but um, we also want to make some predictions. If this is working, we should be able to actually do something. So when we had participants watching Aladdin in that uh, uh, slide I showed you earlier, of course, there are also trailers before the Aladdin show in the cinema. So we track their physiology looking at the trailers. And there were uh, five of them, and this we then measured the determinism. We tracked the coordination in their physiology, and this is our results. So from our predictions, if we were right, we will find out in six months' time that this will be the box office taking of these movies. 
me might be, we might be wrong entirely, but as scientists, we're trying to put our predictions in front of you. So we predict that X-Men, uh, Dark Phoenix, which is a terrible movie. I watched it on the plane over. It is really terrible. But the trailer got the highest coordination in the physiology. So our prediction will be in six months' time, that will be the biggest box office take uh, above Toy Story. And the Playmobil movie got by far the lowest. We could be wrong, but we're trying to generate uh, these predictions. So look out for these movies and their success, and you'll see if we were right. Uh, with that, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Amber Chang, the master student, uh, Joe Devlin, and John Hogan, who you'll see elsewhere at the symposium. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Daniel. So we will welcome the request question from Ross. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I actually have two questions. The first is, all your examples at the beginning uh, for coordination seem to have like a clear, if I may use the word, top-down component, right? Somebody is explicitly mimicking, you are coordinating to march in a band. But a lot of the actual data that you showed is more about coordination that's triggered by some kind of a stimulus. Do you think these are two different things um, or are they the same? Uh, and a second very different question, it's really interesting data in the end, but have you, have you thought about whether there is this idea of good and bad synchrony? Like can you have a stimulus that everybody hates equally and so you get some kind of a synchrony in the signal because then you have high synchrony that's not going to predict success. So in those cases, maybe if you include something about the means and then look at synchrony on top, can you improve your predictions in those scenarios? Uh, excellent, yes. So let me answer the first question first. Um, so that's a very good point. And you can just use words like coordination and synchrony, but when you actually have to flesh out the mathematics of how these signals are related, there's many different ways to be coordinated. Uh, but we actually did an experiment where we contrasted these two possibilities that the questioner raised. So we did a dance workshop with a professional choreographer, and we had two conditions. In one case, he was instructing them to do these dance moves. I'm not going to do them for you. Uh, and he instructed them so that they were all synchronized. By the way, he instructed them, they were all marching and swinging their arms in time with each other. In the other case, uh, they were free to go at their own time. And our prediction was that we would have more affiliation, more liking in the case where we told them to move their arms in time. And it completely failed. We didn't get any difference between those conditions. But they had wrist sensors on that were tracking their coordination. And we could actually put a number on how much they were copying each other, not doing the same thing at the same time with a top-down signal, which is what you asked, but just how much they chose to copy the style of movement of each other. When we looked at that, that correlated with all the affiliation. So there, we didn't have a top-down signal. It was bottom-up. It was people self-organizing and choosing to copy, and that had the stronger effect. So you can tease these things apart, but it's a really interesting area that we haven't quite got a hold of yet. And often when you read experiments, people don't distinguish between those two types. We think they are importantly different. Your second question was about uh, good and bad types of coordination, which again is a very interesting point. And yes, I think overall, most trailers are enjoyable. Most movies are enjoyable, so we're not really looking at something that is very aversive. So we might find a coordinated response when everyone agrees how terrible something is. Uh, but we haven't explored that end of the distribution, as you suggested. There is some evidence, though, in the literature on physiological coordination that sometimes synchrony is bad. So in general, if you look at heart rate synchrony uh, between people, um, if they're in love with each other, they will synchronize better. Um, if a therapist has a bond with a patient, they will synchronize. But if you're in marriage therapy, uh, it's very bad to coordinate. So if you look at two people who are having an argument with a therapist, if they coordinate and their physiology is coordinated, that means they're having an argument. That means I'm getting upset and my wife is getting upset and we're getting more and more upset. So there the more successful couples are the uncoordinated ones where one person gets upset and the other person down regulates and listens and then they swap. So in these sort of extreme cases where we're arguing around our marriage, yes, yeah, synchrony is not always a good thing. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so um, the whole theme of this talk was about uh, synchronization and orchestration, but I, I'm interested in um, individual differences. So for example, like, uh, so if uh, the participants here are watching evaluated multiple clips, I was wondering if so like the per, uh, one person showing high deviation from mean one clip 
also show a higher deviation for another clip. So uh, another question is about, um, so for example, like if uh, there's any um, uh, physiological measure that um, uh, explains uh, the, the individual, individual um, preferences or uh, any other like, behavioral measures. Uh, yes, that's a very interesting point. Um, and I don't have good data to answer you. Uh, so when we looked at the physiology, what we did is normalize all the signals. So if someone is very, having a very high response or they're just very sweaty, uh, we factor out all those individual differences. And our methodology has been to learn about groups overall. Uh, so sadly, I don't have a good data answer for you. Uh, we do have some indication that um, expertise matters in research we've done where people are watching a performance of modern dance and we're looking at coordination, physiological and motor, of the audience watching the dancers. So when you're watching this dance, do you sway in time with that? And there we do find a difference between the professional dancers and the regular audience members who seem to be relating to this stimulus in quite a different way and they've got a different pattern of coordination. Uh, so I think your intuition is right, but I don't have strong data to answer. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, I have a question following up on Vinod's question on, in some senses, what is it that you are thinking you're measuring? When I understand your answer to Vinod's question correctly, you're saying, well, we don't really know whether it's good or bad, right? So it could be synchrony, could be predicting success, but it might also predict uh, no success. Um, so, so, what, so what is your, th what's your idea, what's your theory, what, what, what is it actually that you're measuring? Is it engagement or why does this work? Why does it work with heart rate and not with uh, skin conductance in one example and, and so on? Uh, yes, so I think what we're measuring when we find that this physiology, physiology is synchronized is that the stimulus is having a strong effect on us. And in the context of movie uh, trailers, the difference is that if I am engaged in this, this uh, stimulus, it's mostly that I like it. But if you had other stimuli that engage us because we commonly hated it, we might find a similar thing. Uh, sorry to be political, if we all watched a press conference by a politician that we all hated, we might synchronize in the same way. And that's not a positive evaluation, that's that we've had a common response. So I think what we're measuring is a common response and a successful stimuli that engages people. And in most contexts, that will be positive engagement. So, so in other words, um, and I think you had something like this, um, but I can't remember 100%. So if you would, instead of making the comparison with uh, asking people about liking and so forth, the, the better com comparison measure would be likes, uh, like Facebook likes or YouTube likes, that's what you're saying. Uh, yes, possibly. But we're still trying to unpick exactly what this means. Uh, we have the correlation and understanding exactly what it is measuring is the tricky thing. The surprising thing to us is this physiological correlation didn't seem to correlate with their explicit liking. So people, it's if they're not aware of their physiology being engaged, which is a very strange thing. So my physio physiological engagement is predicting box office sales, but if I say if I like the movie, that's not giving me any useful information. That disconnect is very strange and interesting to us. Oh, sure, there are enormous factors that go into movie success. But why should it be that a movie success, whether or not it's because it's a trailer or has a celebrity in it or has had more of a marketing campaign, why should that be at all related to physiology?
But I think that's what we're interested in. If you have a response to a movie that's driven by memory or familiarity or by that theme song that you recognize, that changes your physiology and that's what we're tapping into. So I don't see these as confounds, I see that as part of the phenomena that's driving your movie liking. Uh, that's absolutely right. That's why we're making these predictions and putting them on the line. And if you have ideas of what movies we should watch that don't have sequels, that don't have this effect, we would love to test those. So yes, yeah, entirely right. We, your question is entirely valid. It's an empirical uh, question, whether or not it's true or not. And we would love to find that out. Okay, so let's move to the round table. So thank you. Uh, please give us a minute to prepare the chairs. <laughs>